Hey everybody, thank you so much for making it to our YouTube channel. I'm super glad that you are here. I hope that today's talk blesses you and it grows your relationship with Jesus. Before we get into the message though, hit that subscribe button and hit the bell notification so that you can be notified every single time that we post. Love you and I'll see you soon at the end of this talk. So here is the first sign that you may not be ready for a relationship. Number one, you're in rebound mode. Oof, it's already spicy. <laughs> Ole. <laughs> Arriba. <laughs> if your ex is still in your mind, I mean, drop the mic, I can walk out, you came here what you needed for, right? If your ex is still in your mind, you're probably on rebound mode and dating is just a form for you to cope with your heartbreak. This is completely unhealthy and you're going to create more damage in the long run. You'll hurt yourself and you're going to hurt him or you're going to hurt her. Anytime that your mind is still preoccupied with how your ex is doing, where he's at, if you're constantly checking his Instagram, if you're, and, 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 and it got worse for you now because now you can't see their activity, right? So you don't know what he's liking. Have you guys seen the movie, um, the, the Netflix TV show, You? Yeah. What's the guy's name? Joe. Some of you are Joe. <laughs> you ask him how his day was going and you already know how his day is going. <laughs> and, the reason why, <laughs> and the reason why, it's because you're still into him. And the biggest temptation for some people is that when they're, they've broken up and they're still into the person that they were dating, they want to use somebody else to get that person out of their heart. But I'm going to tell you something. That is a very dangerous, dangerous decision that you're making. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're going to hurt yourself. Yeah. But not only are you going to hurt yourself, you're going to hurt somebody else. Yeah. Number two, or the second one is, you want someone to save you. You're looking for someone to come save you. You're looking for someone to come fix you. You're looking for someone to be your emotional support. You got to be your emotional support. You got to learn how to work on you. You got to learn how to become. Because no one else is going to change you. No one else is going to make you become. And you're going to add a resume that belongs to Jesus on a, another imperfect, immortal, mortal human being just like yourself. If you can't fix you, you can't expect other people to fix you. The one that can fix your heart and the issues inside your soul is Jesus. And sometimes we take Jesus' resume and we give it to a guy. Big fail. Or you take Jesus' resume and you give it to a girl, hoping that they will be your, uh, your healer, hoping that they will be your rescuer, hoping that they will be your savior, hoping that they will mend you, hoping that they will um, help you. And let me tell you, they can to a certain degree, but when they do not meet your expectations, you're going to put a burden of eternity on somebody else that is not meant to carry that burden. And then you guys are eventually just going to hurt each other. If you're unhappy and want an easy way out of your problem, a relationship is not the answer. There are a lot of people who struggle with rejection and loneliness. Someone say amen. amen. And because of that, they enter into a relationship expecting someone to save them from their pain. If you struggle with loneliness and rejection and you think that someone else is going to fix you, I'm so sorry, you are deceived. No one else is going to fix your heart. Loneliness is not corrected with a relationship. Rejection issues will never correct your issues. It will never correct your mindset. It will never correct your heart. It's only going to get worse because this becomes burdensome in the relationship, which causes it to shatter. And the person that you're dating is then left off, or the, you, sorry, you are then left off feeling more rejected and lonelier than ever, which spirals you down to a deeper pain. And the cycle repeats. If you have lonely and rejection issues and then you go get someone to fix them, which they will not be able to, maybe temporarily they can, but if you go and get someone else to fix your lonely, rejected issues, it's just a matter of time before they leave. Yeah. And this will create a deeper issue, a deeper pain inside your heart. You'll feel more lonely and you'll feel more rejected, which makes you want to go find the next wrong right person. Do you see how the cycle goes? And then you hand over Jesus' resume to that next right, wrong person. They won't be able to help you. They leave, and then you're left lonelier and more rejected than ever. The cycle begins to repeat. In this type of situation, we also see that the person who is in need of a savior can become manipulative and controlling in order not to get rejected again. This is a recipe for chaos. If you need someone to save you, 
then you may not be ready to enter a relationship. Yeah. So you got to ask yourself, are you someone um, that needs to be saved? If you are in a condition of, with your heart, your mind, your confidence, your insecurity, all that, if you're depressed, if you feel like things are not healthy inside your heart and you're putting the expectation for someone else that is another mortal, imperfect human being like you to fix you, you're going to hurt him, her, and yourself because the broken trying to fix that which is broken only breaks it all the more. Yes. Here's the next one. You prefer to avoid his or her family. Well, I'm going to your house. I'm stepping into your heart. You, so, so seven signs that you may not be ready for a relationship. If, if, if you prefer to avoid his or her family. So oftentimes, no one ever teaches us to build a relationship with our in-laws and we don't even consider it. But dang, that's what I wrote. This plays a major role in our relationships. Do you know how shady it would be if I ever had a daughter and her high school boyfriend never wants to meet me? Yes. If I find that he wants to run away from me, like how he would, I can run pretty fast too. And before any guy ever wants to date my daughter, he has to date me. And we're going to go on nice long walks. And we're going to introduce him to Lucy, my father's shotgun. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> Please don't take me out of context and don't think that I would kill somebody, okay? I don't want anybody leaving the church. Pastor's violent, oh my God, no, this church is wrong. No, it's a joke. <laughs> if I ever had a daughter and the guy that she's seeing runs away from me, that's shady. Yeah. And I would not like that. Yeah. And the reason why a lot of young people run away from his or her family is because no one's teaching them. All the things that we learn about when it comes to the relationship between you and your in-laws has to do with them being against you. But maybe they would not be against you if you learned how to have a conversation. Yeah. We need to be future oriented. We need to be young people, young adults, adults and adults that are future oriented. We need to be visionaries and we need to realize if I marry this person, his or her parents will be a part of my life. So I need to be willing to connect. They're gonna be there at your children's birthday parties. They're gonna be there at your spouse's birthday parties. You're gonna have to see them at Thanksgiving. You're gonna have to see them at Christmas. If you're gonna have to see them at anywhere, everywhere. It's foolish for you not to think I need to build a relationship with my in-laws. You have to. So man, the question is this. Can you have a conversation with an adult and sustain it? Hey. Women, young ladies, can you have a conversation with adults and sustain it? Yeah. Or are you going to talk about Pokemon Go? <laughs> or keeping up with the Kardashians? If someone talks to me about keeping up with the Kardashians, nothing wrong with them. We love Kim. <laughs> yeah. They're a friend of 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 a brother in Christ of mine. <laughs> Kylie too. We love him. But let me tell you something. If your conversations entail around reality TV shows, Lord have mercy. Get into some books. Read some. Listen, watch some podcasts that will edify your heart, your mind. Talk about things that <laughs> really matter. Learn some appropriate jokes that you can share at the table. Some of the memes that you enjoy the most are inappropriate. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it to have some private laughter, but you got to be intentional about connecting with your in-laws. Are you intentional about creating a space where you are engaging and you're present with your future in-laws instead of being shady or shady or shady? Yeah. Do you avoid the topic of meeting his or her parents? If you do, it's because you may not be ready for a relationship, yeah. so, right? Yeah. 
people only run away when there's something to hide or they just don't want to be transparent. Yeah, that's good. But if you know who you are, if you know that you're a young man, that you have godly character, you have transparency, you have, you have uh, uh, character um, in regards to your integrity, yeah. you, you have ambition that is healthy, yeah. you, you have something that you've made for yourself, you're making something for yourself, yeah. you are responsible, respectful, you should have no problem wanting to connect. As a matter of fact, you should look forward to building a relationship with the family because what the devil wants is he wants to um, divide. He wants to keep you and your spouse away from her family or his family. And that, that is not right. We need to be people that say, I want to absorb the family. I want to love my in-laws. I want to call her mom and call him dad. I want to be able to have a bond with him. I want to be able to have a bond with her. How amazing would it be if you're like in your 20s and your in-laws think the world of you? That's notable. That's respectful. That's noble. Here's the next one. You're seeking to be completed. If you're seeking to be completed, you may not be ready for a relationship. Imagine this water bottle, okay? It's halfway full. Let's pretend it's halfway full. Can you guys see the water? And then this bottle of water represents you. And you're halfway full. You're not complete. And then you start dating a girl who is not halfway full. And she's half complete. What's going to happen when you both start taking from each other? One of you is going to have to be left empty. When you start pouring into her, or when you start pouring into him, because you're half full, you're going to be left empty. Now the goal is for you to become and find someone that has become. And when you have two full water bottles, anytime you pour, they overflow. This is the goal. For you to be a man or a woman that you can make your other half overflow. I think that there's nothing worse than you being a woman and having to babysit your husband. All right, John. All right, Timmy. No, no Timmy's here, right? Put on some clothes. It's time to go to work now. We have bills to pay. Five more minutes. No, now imagine a man that could wake up in the morning, have his workout for all you early birds, cook some breakfast, and then cook you some breakfast too. Instead of you waking up and going, oh, I gotta pick up his clothes, dirty underwear, socks, I gotta do his laundry. All right, Timmy, 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 wake up. It's time for you to go to work, Timmy. Timmy, please, can you be responsible? I know you stayed up till 5 a.m. playing league last night, but Timmy, you really gotta be responsible, Timmy. I know that you have a saved file, Timmy, but that doesn't really matter because that's a fantasy world. We live in a real world where your hours where you work is actually what pays the bills, Timmy. Timmy, can you be realistic, Timmy? See, one of the issues with incomplete people is their lack of security. And an insecure person in a relationship can cause a lot of emotional damage and a lot of hurt. An insecure person will be the type of mind that says, I'm going to hurt her or I'm going to hurt him before they hurt me. Because I don't want to be hurt first. And an insecure person makes scenarios in their minds that are not true about their loved ones. And then you're going, oh, you know, they texted says that she's out with friends and her battery percentage is at 1%. I'll text you when I'm done. An insecure person turns into Joe from you. (laughs) Have you guys seen that meme? Memes are preaching loud this series. And because you're insecure, you start making scenarios in your head, and then you start believing things, and it's all because of your insecurity. And then while you're insecure, guess what you do? You're going, hell no, she ain't hurting me first. He ain't hurting me first. I'm going to hurt them first. Why? Insecurity. 
And the reason why you're insecure is because you're incomplete. Yeah. If you have confidence in who you are, yeah. if you know what you stand for in life, mm -hmm. if you know what you're doing, yeah. there's this beautiful attribute that every relationship sh should have, every person in every relationship should have, and that is security. Yeah. You know who you are, you know what your worth is, yeah. you know your value, and you know what you stand for, and you know what you've got. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Here's the next one. You have no vision. Seven times you're not ready for a relationship. You have no vision. Yeah. If marriage isn't the goal for your relationship, a heartbreak is. <laughs> to which all you 14, 15 year olds are going to hell no. If your hell no is there inside your mind, because you can't say it out loud, right? I understand you, don't worry, we won't put you on the spot. If you know you can't marry that person, then what the heck are you doing? What are you doing? What's the purpose? There has to be a vision. In other words, if you don't have a purpose, if you don't have a plan, a vision for your relationship, then why are you going to get intertwined with someone? It's not a smart plan. It's not a good plan. If you're going to get mixed up with your feelings, your emotions, you're going to give them a part of who you are, your virginity away. Keep that. Keep that for someone that merits it, which is the one that you're going to say I do to. Marriages should have a vision as well. Now, this is not just for dating. Let me give you a little bit of my perspective, okay? This is just what I'm going to apply in my life and you can take it if you want it. When I get married, after I say I do, and after we're done my honeymoon, you know what I'm gonna do with my wife? We're gonna have another honeymoon. <laughs> just kidding. Not really, we will. But we're gonna sit down and plan. And here's, he, here's how the conversation will go. Baby, what do you want us to look like in the next 10 years? What do we want to accomplish together? Yeah. When do we want to have kids? Yeah. Year two, year three, year four, year five, year 10? I'll be 40 in 10 years. <laughs> God have mercy. <laughs> God hurry, please. <laughs> you gotta have, you gotta have a plan. Yeah. What area of Vancouver do you want to, in 10 years, what area of Vancouver are we going to buy property? West Vancouver, British properties in North Vancouver, downtown, do you want a condo, a big condo, a small condo, less to clean? <laughs> What's your plan? What's your plan? What kind of car do you want to have in our 10th year, baby? You want a Tesla or do you want a Tesla? Which one? <laughs> Black or white? Not the red one, just kidding. Do you have a vision? Like, I'm not in a relationship, but I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about when 2030 hits, I'm going to be 40. I need to have an image of my life. And I already have, and we shared it at Masterclass. I have an image for my, I have a vision for my life. Your marriage also needs to have a vision. And sometimes people think that when they get married, it's over. Marriages should have a vision. Because saying I do is not the end. Saying I do is actually the beginning. Yeah. It's the beginning. <laughs> Saying I do is a good, good milestone, but some of us only want to climax at the I do, and that's so poor. After I do is when the real work begins. Because while you were dating, you were seeing the representative. Because you don't know what type of breath you're going to wake up to the next morning. <laughs> That's no longer the representative. They didn't have the time to put the mint in before they say, good morning, babe. <laughs> <laughs> like, you don't know what he's gonna smell like. That's where the hard work comes in. Because right now he... Oh my God, he smells so good. Like he just captures my heart. No, you gotta... No, no, you, you don't know what that's gonna look like later. <laughs> it might be different. She's not going to be all dolled up in the mornings, bro. 
you got to know what you're going to, it's going to be different. When you get married, you're going to wake up and be like, hello. <laughs> Why am I saying this to you? Because some of us think that when we get married, it's the end. Marriage is the beginning of the real hard work. You're going to finally get to see what ticks him off. You're going to see what ticks her off. So you need to be a visionary. You need to be a visionary. Visionaries are people who think ahead. Say ahead. ahead. Say ahead. ahead. Thinking ahead is a sign of maturity. You're an adult. You've grown up. And mature people don't remain juvenile or childish about their future. Mature people, they do not remain juvenile or childish about their future. They think and format a vision that they remain consistent to. Because, you see, there are people who have the body of an adult, but they think like a child. That's why you can't just say yes because she has curves. You gotta, you gotta reach her mind. You gotta know what her mind is like. Boys and girls, men and women. If you're single, looking for someone, get into their mind. Not in a manipulative way. Get to learn their mind, better said. <laughs> Thank God I corrected that or else, gosh, some of you would have laughed going, pastor's weird. <laughs> Teaching people to get into their minds. Is this some like MK Ultra seminar? <laughs> no, 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 get to learn their mind, okay? See, look, if you listen to this, it's very important. Some of you are looking for a man of God, a woman of God, and you're so easily impressed by how infatuated he or she is with God when they're on a high. Oh, I love Jesus so much. I read my Bible 30 times a day. I pray 15 times a day, and last time I prayed, it was like for five hours. And then you're going, boom, 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 boom. Woman of God, woman of God, woman of God, woman of God, get her the ring, get her the ring, get her the ring, propose. Please, do not get infatuated and call someone a man of God or a woman of God just because they're infatuated with God in a high. What you ought to pay attention to is how their infatuation will rise or drop when they're in a low. So oftentimes, yeah, that was good. Who are they when it gets tough? Because that's what you're going to marry. Who are they when the process is not looking the way they want the process to look like? Who are they when they are not getting what they want? Who are they when hard trials face him or her in the face? Who are they? This is what you should be paying attention to. Don't pay attention to how they love God when they finally got approved to buy the car. That's silly. Of course they're going to be a man of God. Yeah. Don't, don't get infatuated by her speech when she's in church and her favorite song is playing and she's praising God. That's silly. What you ought to pay attention to is who is she in her lows? Who is he in his lows? Is he consistent? Does he persevere? Is he flaky? Does he break easily? Does she break easily? Is she committed? Is she stable when it gets rocky? Who are they? That's what you should be paying attention to. Saying I do is not the end, it's the beginning. And there are people who have the body of an adult, but they still think like a child. Meaning they are not visionaries. So if you're not a visionary, you have no vision for your life. Maybe you need to work on you first before you intertwine your life with someone that is half complete. Here's the next one. You're indifferent to building a home. 
You're indifferent to building a home. No one liked that one, eh? <laughs> what do I mean by this? Did you know that part of marriage, okay, a relationship, the goal of a relationship should be marriage. Because yeah. yeah. if your relationship doesn't have the goal for marriage, it will end in a heartbreak. Because there's no way that you can glue two people together and then nothing rip apart. Take two pieces of paper, put gum in between, put them together, and now try or glue, and then try to un-separate both of these two pieces of paper. It's impossible. They will tear each other up. Yeah. This is what happens when two people date, they have sex together before they get married, and they don't have marriage as their goal. What's going to happen? You're going to be tearing parts of who you are in your soul apart. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. So dating, right? The vision of a relationship should be marriage. Okay. Here's the part that we never think about. That when you get married, guess what that means? You got to build a... How? You got to build a home. If you're indifferent to building a home, if you've never even thought about that, you may not be ready, possibly, for a relationship. Let me give you an example of this, okay? Coming to church, you saw the worship team play, and they transitioned between each song really, really well. Amen? Yeah. The transitions in the worship team are so amazing that they're seamless. You don't even pay attention. No one's pausing going, the song ended. All right, the next song is on page 385. We will start in the third verse. And then you don't see musicians scrambling to find page 385. They came prepared. The greeters are prepared. Sea Kids is prepared. My sermon was a preparation. Imagine if you came to church and I just started speaking, oh, I don't really know what I'm going to speak about today, but, but you know my heart. You wouldn't follow this church at all, not even online. <laughs> what you came into was something that has taken time to build. Yeah. But if you came here, no one smiled at you, no one greeted you, the carpet was dirty, er, and everything was <laughs> and everything was in shambles. The worship team didn't know what they were doing. I came up here and didn't preach what I was supposed to preach. And I started talking nonsense that wouldn't edify you, build you, and take you to another level where you can leave Crave Church and be like, I learned something new today. I got challenged today. God is drawing me closer to him. If you came in here and see kids was not ready and they were just a complete mess, guess what? You came to a church that started, but not a church that was built. Okay. Listen. When you're married and you don't think about building a home, did you know that the simplest things are not common sense sometimes? Like you're gonna go to the washroom to brush your teeth at night and there's no toothpaste because your mom always bought the toothpaste. You get into the shower, there's no soap, there's no shampoo, there's no conditioner for her, oh my God. You don't know how to cook, both men and women. I think every man in this house should learn how to cook. Yeah. And all the women said, yeah. and by cook, I do not mean ramen, <laughs> which is noodles for all of you that are a different part of the world. You know, all these things make a difference in the marriage because you don't want to just buy a house. You want to Build a home. So good. And here's the last sign that you may not be ready for a relationship. You run from healthy confrontation. This one was so good, I saved it for last. If you have, and I want all ears, listen to this. If you have a tendency to keep your walls up and are emotionally closed off, you don't let anybody in it will cause a lot of problems in your relationship because disagreements and friction are inevitable in every relationship. If you have a habit of holding back and not expressing your emotions when there's conflict, you must work through your fears and your trust issues before committing to someone. You gotta work it. You gotta work through it. Because a lot of you close yourselves off 
A lot of you have walls bigger than the walls of China and Trump's wall put together. You ain't letting anyone in. There's no facial expressions on your face. There's no sign of that something's wrong. And if you enter into a relationship like that, you're going to run away from confrontation all the time because friction, tension, problems, trials are inevitable in every relationship. And we have to be a generation that doesn't run away from confrontation. Instead, take a healthy approach of confrontation. A healthy relationship is about two people being able to be vulnerable with each other. Okay, I need to say that one again, okay? Because you need to catch this one. A healthy relationship is about two people. Not one. Or zero. Both of you need to be willing to be vulnerable with each other. And communicate the good things. But also communicate the bad things without getting nasty. That's healthy confrontation. And you're going to need it. But if you run away from it, it's because you may not be ready. And healthy confrontation leads us to grace. Someone say grace on three. One, two, three. Grace. And this is what we learned last week. That Jesus was teaching his disciples about relationships. And then he gave him this one principle that would change every relationship in the world if we were to adopt this one principle. He gave them a key secret. And he said... This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. If you were to love the same way that I have loved you, your relationships, 90 something percent of the problems would actually dissolve and bow down to that, that principle's feet. Yeah. Now, when the disciples are hearing this, because this is Jesus teaching them a very, very powerful principle that I think that we should adopt and we should learn to love each other. They had no clue what he was meaning. And the reason they had no clue was because a few days later, Jesus demonstrates to them what this love meant by dying on the cross for them. This took their breath away. And his death took his last breath away. And this is where the Following, and this is where following Jesus plays a huge role in our relationships today. Because following Jesus doesn't just make your life better, but following Jesus makes you better at life. Makes you better at life. Now we hear the principle, you know, love each other as I have loved you. And we need to really today in chapter two, week two of Don't Play Games, define what that love really means. God's definition of love is clearly or very well defined by a guy named Paul, and he defines it in a letter that he wrote to a church in Corinth, and this is what he says, and this is what he wrote to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient. Love isn't pushy. It won't pressure you into a decision that you do not desire. If he says he loves you, and you're saying, I don't want to sleep with you until you put a ring on it. Or actually, until we say, I do. There we go. Put the ring on it. Doesn't. Yeah. You got it, right? If he says he loves you, and you don't want to sleep with him, love is not pushy because it's patient. If she says she loves you, bro, and she just keeps trying to pressure you, oh, how terrible, right? And she's wanting to pressure you into sleeping with her. You will know that true love is patient. It's not pushy if you don't desire love, real love, accommodates to your pace and your capacity. Love is patient. Love is also kind. Love is loaning someone else your strength instead of crushing them through their weakness, just like God did for you. God never crushed you in your weakness. Instead, he died for you in your weakness. And he uses you in your weakness. And he is faithful to you in your weaknesses. So when you're kind, you're going to lend someone strength. In their weakness, you will understand, God is faithful to me in my weaknesses. God loves, God has loved me in my weaknesses. He's been faithful to me in my weaknesses. 
So if he's been good to me in my weaknesses, how can I crush him? How can I crush her in her weaknesses? Instead, it's kind, it edifies, and it builds. And then it says, it does not envy. It does not boast. It is not. In other words, love allows the other person to shine. Love can share the spotlight. Did you know that there are people who actually feel bothered by the success of their loved one? And they have a spirit and a heart of competitiveness. And they don't like it when Bay or Boo are succeeding. They don't want Bay to shine. They don't want Boo to shine. They, want, they, they, they get uncomfortable when their, their spouse or their boyfriend or their girlfriend is succeeding. They don't like it. They're competitive. And that's because they don't have the love that God has. Because love, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. Love doesn't need to step in the spotlight all the time. And it pushes the other person to shine. Love allows the other person to even get the credit and the attention when they don't even deserve it. Yeah. And then he continues and he says, love does not dishonor others. Love is always honoring people even when the other people are not honorable. Because love treats the other person like they are more important than we are. It puts other people first. It puts other people first. And God is saying, I want you to treat others like they're more important than you. Because I treated you like you we're more important than me. God loves you. This is why he put you first. And this is why he's saying, I want you to treat people like they're more important and put them first. Love, watch this. He can, continues, Paul keeps continuing. He teaches the church what love is. And he says, love is not self-seeking. We have a more current term that says love is not selfish. Love puts the interest and the needs of others first. Have you ever met someone that only could talk about themselves? And no matter how far you get into a conversation, if it's about something else, they always manage to make it about. And it's like, please, for God's sake, put a lid on it. Please, please. I'm tired of hearing the story. I get it. I get you. You are amazing. And they always talk about what they need, what they want, their plans, their dreams. Everything's about them. They never, ever asked you on your date, how are you doing today? Why? Because there's selfishness. If two people decide to put the other person first, I think that we would solve 90% of our relationship problems. Yeah. Yeah. Think about it. If two people decide to put each other first, what a beautiful marriage. Amen. Wow. Yeah. And then he continues and says, love is not easily angered. And we highlight the word easily because it's impossible not to get angry. But Paul says, if you're going to love like Christ loved you, you're not going to be easily angered. Because love can listen. Amen. Love can understand. Love can take it in and not react. Did you know that when you're angry, the first thing you want to do is air your opinion and tell your story? Because everybody has a story of how they saw it, how they felt it, how they think about it. And every person that's angry, their behavior makes sense to them. But love says, it's not that you won't get angry, it's that you won't easily get angry. Because it's impossible not to get angry. I like how he put the word easily before. And he's trying to say, when there's love inside, you're willing to remain and, and compose yourself and listen. You're willing to hear the other person's story. You're willing to absorb what they think and feel because everybody that acts angry, their story is common sense to them. What they behave like makes sense to them. And the person that loves will not get easily triggered 
Instead, they are willing to absorb and take it all in before making up a decision and telling their side of the story. And what's funny is this, what he says next, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love doesn't have an Evernote file titled, All the Ways Bay Did Me Wrong. <laughs> and what's interesting about people that keep a file or a record of wrongs is that they never keep track of their record of wrong. It's like they forget. <laughs> And then he continues and says, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always, yes. always, yes. always, yes. always, yes. always. Yes. wow, wow. Hallelujah. All right, in summary, go to my next slide. This is what love is. Love is patient, kind, not jealous, not arrogant, honoring, selfless, not easily angered, not a scorekeeper, protecting, trusting, hopeful, and persevering. Wow. This is the way that God loves you. And this is the way that God wants you to love others. And here's the question that I want you to wrestle with. Isn't this what you're looking for in somebody? I mean, I'm sure you want him to be patient with you, right? You want her to be kind. You don't want him or her to be jealous. Now, I've had hell now. You don't like someone that is arrogant. You wouldn't want someone that can't honor. You want someone that's honoring, someone that is selfless. You wouldn't want someone that's easily angered. Somebody say amen. You don't want a scorekeeper. Oh, those ones are annoying. You want someone that can protect you, someone that can trust you, someone that can hope for all the best, and someone that is covenant, not contract. Someone that is persevering. And if you're married... Isn't this what you were hoping for? If you're married, isn't this what you were hoping for in your spouse? So if you're player one today, which is all of you, you're probably saying, man, I don't know if I could ever do something like, something like that. I don't know if I could ever be that for someone else. And this is the beauty of following Jesus because he says, follow me. And if you're wondering where you're going to follow me to, this is it. This is where I will lead you to. For all of you that go, I need to follow Jesus, I need to follow Jesus, but I don't know if this is the right decision for my life right now. Let me tell you, this is the best decision for your life right now. Gina. So, this whole following Jesus deal, it's so important for your life. Jesus' first step for your life isn't to be perfect. Jesus' first step for your life isn't to be a preacher. Jesus' first step for your life isn't to know the Bible and be a walking Bible and preaching at everybody. The first step that Jesus says is not be more spiritual. He never said be more integrous. Or he's, he never says have more character. The first step that Jesus gives all of you today is this. Follow me. Follow me. And if you ever get curious, if you're ever wondering where you're going to follow me to, it's this list. It's patience when you mess up. It's kindness when you think that you deserve punishment. It's not jealous. It's not arrogant. It's honor when you have sin to give them. Sin for honor is his offer. It's him saying, I want to show you how selfless I am. It's him telling you, man, I'm a huge lover of who you are because I'm not easily angry. I don't get easily angry with you. And that's the picture, that's the gossip you've heard about God that, that you think that God is angry with you and God is not angry with any of you. It's him saying, I'm going to protect you, trust. I'm going to instill trust in you because I know your trust has been broken. It's him saying, I want to give you hope when everything gets dark. It's him saying, I want to persevere with you yeah. till you reach eternity with me. Come on. Come on. This is the love of Christ. Amen. And this is offered to you. And God is saying, if we can all offer 
true love to our loved ones. Imagine the marriages of Vancouver City. We can change the world one marriage at a time. Now the key to all of this, it's to experience God. Not just hear about God, but for you to experience and feel His love. That's the key. You want to get better relationships? You need to first experience the love that He gives in order for you to be familiar with the love you need to give. Remember this, you cannot give what you don't have. You can only give what you carry, what, what you have in the inside. And a lot of you need to come today, tonight, and trade your pain, your trust issues, your arrogance, your pride. You need to trade your depression. You need to trade your anger and say, God, I'm going to give this to you. And in return, I want your love. Amen. Because the key to this whole thing is not to hear about God. That's wonderful. And that's a good step that you came to church today to hear about him. The key is for you to experience his love so that you could be transformed. Yes. In order for you to give to others the type of love that was given to you. Yes. So here are the next steps that some of you need to take. Step one. Let God know that you want to give him space in your heart. Some of you need to let God know that you want to give him the space. Meaning, you need to open the door of your heart and say, you know what, I want to welcome you in my heart, in my life. I want you to have a say in my life. I want you to be a part of my life. I want to listen to your word, your words, and I want my decisions to revolve around you. This is the next step that some of you need to take in order for you to have a healthy marriage. The second step that some others of you might need to take is this. Return to God if you've left or drifted away from Him. Some of you have been far from God for a very long time and you've left Him. And you need to tell Him, meet me here again. I want to meet with you here again. I want to come back to you. I've tried it my way and all I have is loss, pain, hopelessness, more trust issues. And so you need to make the decision you need to make the decision. And the third step for some of you is this. Open your heart and mind to receive God's love. And I think that this one's a very important one for all of us. I'll tell you why. There are a lot of you, you cannot receive God's love because you don't think you're good enough. And there's something that's capping you. And it could be a mental stronghold. Did you know that an elephant, if you raise a baby elephant and you put a peg on the ground and you tie a chain to its one of its legs, and it can't move because it doesn't have the strength to move. And you keep teaching that little baby elephant that they can't move. And they'll try at the beginning because they're weak and they're babies. They will not be able to move. But did you know that when that elephant grows up, you can put a plastic chair on the ground, put a, 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 a chain on its leg, and clip that chain to a plastic chair that's like a matchstick for you. And that elephant will not move. There's a stronghold in his mind. Some of you have a stronghold in your mind that you can't receive God's love. And I want to break that tonight and tell her that his love is for you. He's kind. He's patient. He's loving. He's hopeful. He's honoring. He's gracious. He's merciful. He is for you. He loves you. Hey, thank you so much for listening. I hope that blessed you. And if you would ever want to partner financially with us, you can do so by going to www.cravechurch.org or the link will be in the description box. Share the message, spread the love, and I'll see you again next time.